Hello there, I'm Joseph Sakai, I'm the Chief Waterfront Design Officer at Waterfront Alliance. Pleased to welcome you to Breaking News on Breakwaters, the webinar on the wedge verification of the Illinois Beach State Park Shoreline Stabilization Project. We're incredibly excited about this project, eager for the design team to share it with you today. And, and we'll, I'll, I'll start out by giving kind of an overview of the wedge standards. Uh, it, for particularly folks in in the Midwest, it's something that's that's new to the area, though it's been around on the, the East Coast for a number of years. I'll give an overview of that and how it applies to a project like this. And then the 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 fun part is that the design team is going to take you kind of behind the scenes on the project, share the design, share the some of the thought processes behind it, and you get to learn more about this really exciting project. Next slide. So we've got a number of, of speakers today. Um, I represent Waterfront Alliance, which created and administers the, the wedge standard Waterfront Edge Design Guidelines. Uh, we also have Martin Cliver, coastal engineer at Moffat and Nickel, who's joining us. Laura Verdon from Illinois Department of Natural Resources. Heidi Natura from Living Habitats. And Ben Capsule at Nichols Construction Incorporated. They're going to take you through different elements of the of the, the design. You'll get to hear through from each of them today. Next slide. So Waterfront Alliance, which leads the, the wedge standard, our focus is that together we build, transform, revitalize, and protect accessible waterfronts for all communities. We are primarily a, a New York, New Jersey regional organization, but the wedge standards, the Waterfront Edge Design Guidelines, are structured as a national program. Um, so we, we we do everything from climate education, climate policy uh, to the design standards. Next slide. So there are three central principles within WEDGE as a as a rating system. So we are looking at resilience, we're looking at ecology, and we're looking at access on sites. We want to see those three elements woven across waterfront sites, regardless of the of their type. Uh, but those are the three driving principles behind Wedge. Next slide. So Wedge at its heart, and I'm going to say that acronym one more time, Wedge, Waterfront Edge Design Guidelines. Wedge is a rating system. Um, you're probably familiar with LEED. You might be familiar with Envision. These are, are standards that are can be applied to different projects to, to give it a, a certification or a verification of excellence. That's exactly what Wedge is, but Wedge is tailored specifically to waterfront projects. There's a there's so many extra complications and constraints of working on the waterfront, things that you need to be aware of and things that you need to plan for and design that other standards and other types of uh, and kind of regular site planning doesn't cover. Those are incorporated into Wedge, but then there's also huge opportunities on the waterfront that, that you can't do anywhere else. So there's there's different unique habitats, there's recreational components of the waterfront that Wedge is really meant to help bring out of a project to maximize the, the value. We consider Wedge to be the gold standard for waterfront design. The way that we're structured is that Wedge is a points-based system Different elements incorporated into the design are new different points. Wedge has 250 points available across the standard. 130 are needed to pass. So there's some flexibility in there for the design teams and figuring out how they get to though, how they get to that point threshold. But that 130 is still an incredibly rigorous process, um, which makes it incredibly impressive when a project like uh, Illinois Beach State Park is able to, to achieve that. Next slide. So what we really wanted to, uh, to share with this project is that this project is a first in a number of ways. So it's for, for Wedge, it's the first non-urban project. Most of Wedge projects are in, in East Coast cities. Very, it's a very urban focused standard, uh, applies across all kinds of different waterfronts, but the projects that have previously used it tend to be urban. It's the first project in Illinois, the Midwest, and the Great Lakes. It's the first project verified under version 3.0, which expanded the standard to those areas. Previously, Wedge only worked on coastal communities. 
version 3.0 expanded it to, to freshwater systems as well. This was also the first project really focused on in-water enhancements. Um, so much of Wedge is focused on what's happening in the shoreline. This is the first project that's brought in kind of a breakwaters um, type um, design solution. It's the first state park to go through um, the Wedge standards, though certainly there's a number of other, there's municipal parks that have gone through it. And then it's also the first beach nourishment focused project to go through Wedge. Next slide. So there are 14 wedge verified projects to date, including um, Illinois Beach. Um, these range from you know, the project you're gonna learn about today to city parks, to affordable housing developments, to industrial and port facilities. Um, and we are, we, we've got projects in Illinois, New York, Florida, um, and North Carolina with other projects in the pipeline in, in Denver, um, in different communities in Connecticut, New York, and New Jersey. Next slide. So as I said, we've recently launched version 3.0. Wedge started as a tool just for New York Harbor. And the, the rationale for creating it was that Waterfront Alliance, which serves this sort of regional planning role in, in the New York area, got lots of questions around, hey, Will you endorse this project? Will you provide testimony to the land use review process that this is a good project and that Waterfront Alliance supports it? And the initial version of Wedge was really focused on when do we say yes, when do we say no? And that evolved into the rating system that, that exists today that really captured, well, what do we think makes a great waterfront? And how do you promote access and resilience and ecology at the water's edge? That version was launched in 2015. 2019, it, explained, it expanded to be a national coastal standard. And then this past October um, applied to inland projects as well. And this team actually got started on the review as we were developing the version 3.0. So not only is it the first project to receive verification under this new updated and more rigorous standard, um, but it also helped shape some of the credits and some of the scoring uh, as we as it was kind of framed as a as a pilot project for the standard. Next slide. Wedge was created with uh, an expertise from around the country and around different fields through various advisory committees, technical working groups, and technical advisory committees, including with um, this past update. Next slide. And then for this particular project, so the way that Wedge reviews work is that. The project team submits their design materials to Waterfront Alliance, who then are going to bring in a team of external experts. In this particular case, it was an architect, a landscape architect, a coastal engineer, and then a flood risk expert who, who are reviewing the, the design against the standards. They've trained in wedge, they're leaders in the field, and they are very harsh scorers. Um, so we really put the projects through their paces so that when we say, yes, this project earns wedge verification, that the, the team um, has, has, has validated it, and it's a really exceptional project, and that's what happened in this case. The project got uh, 146 points out of the 250. Um, there, there is a typo on my slide that I apologize about. Um, verification is at 130 points, 115 is the old version. Um, so the score of 146, this, this project very easily, very easily passed. Next slide. So we'll very quickly go through the, the, um, the components of the standard. I'll do this at a very, very high level because I want to transition us to uh, learning about the design. Next slide. So our first category in wedge is site assessment and planning. This is going to look at do you have a multidisciplinary team? Is there, for instance, an ecologist or biologist on the team? We're also looking at, at vulnerabilities and, and how you've done the, the site assessments and existing conditions assessments, how you've planned stakeholder engagement, and have you done maintenance and adaptive management planning? Next slide. Category one is gonna look at climate and hazard resilience. How are you reducing risk from the water body? How are you reducing risk from fluvial flooding or stormwater flooding? Do you, how are you contributing to water quality, emergency preparedness, and reducing urban heat? Next slide. 
Category two is community access and connections. We're looking at quality public access areas in the waterfront, visual connections to the waterfront. There's some industrial components here that didn't quite apply to this project. Educational programming, next slide. Transportation access to the water. Um, pathway and greenway connectivity, and then direct connection to connections to the water. Next slide. Edge composition is where we're looking at what's actually happening at the water's edge itself. So if we think of waterfronts as a, a, a spectrum of one end, you've got piers and bulkhead walls and like concrete and steel in the water. And at the other end, you've got beaches and marshes and natural shorelines. We're trying to shift projects this way. It's a big challenge in, in urban environments. This is the only natural shoreline left on, um, in Illinois on Lake Michigan. Um, so you've seen how, how big of an impact that kind of urbanization of the waterfronts had. We're really excited that this project is entirely natural shoreline. And that's really what the, the credits are geared towards uh, shifting projects to do. So we look at What's going on in the, are you choosing an appropriate edge for the waterfront? Are you maintaining or emulating natural shoreline slate and shape and slope? You're protecting the working edge where you have it and then providing ecological enhancements to man-made structures. Next slide. Natural resources and sustainability looks at ecosystem services, habitat, ecosystem connectivity, biodiversity, uh, avoiding disturbances to those ecosystems redeveloping um, and cleaning up degraded sites. Next slide. Environmentally responsible construction, um, sustainable fill and soil management, reduced water use, and then long-term monitoring of the site to see what's really working in the, in the ecology space. The next slide. And then finally, we have innovation, which you can kind of think of as the bonus point. So inventive design is for things like this project's use of the, the um, driftwood is a construction barrier, something that fits resilience, ecology, and access really well, but that isn't scored otherwise, and is something that's really new and unique. Um, and then exemplary performance is for those places where the project goes far above and beyond what Wedge is, is asking for and scoring on. Wedge has performance criteria that it scores on that are already going to be higher than a, what, state regulatory agencies or, or, or typical building codes would require. If you're going above and beyond that, there's additional points available as well. Next slide. All right, I believe I'm turning it over to, to Martin now, who's gonna take you behind the scenes on the project. Go ahead. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Joe, for that introduction. And I have the honor on behalf of the design build team to uh, introduce this project, which is a design build project uh, that provides shoreline protection and has a differentiating ecological focus. Um, Heidi, in a minute, will uh, tell you all about these in-water enhancements that Joe just mentioned earlier, and, and Ben uh, will uh, tell you more about construction. Um, but first, I'll, I'll hand it off to uh, Laura, who represents the uh, owner the Illinois Department of Natural Resources uh, to give you a description of the location and um, characteristics of the park. Uh, Laura, to you, Thank next you. slide. Thank you, Martin. Um, on behalf of the state of Illinois and the Illinois Department of Natural Resources, I wanna welcome you to our park. Next slide. We are located on a coast. It's a freshwater coast. Um, we're located on one of the Great Lakes in the central part of the United States. Um, if you look at the graphic below, north is to your left for orientation, but you can see the volume of green um, ecosystem lands that we have dotted with long linear stretches of swales. Um, this particular topography in this area um, has created for a very unique ecosystem. Next slide. So I want to talk a little bit about the numbers, um, a little bit different from what Joseph talked about. Um, and this is just to give you a little bit of orientation on the park. This is a 4,000 acre park um, located in the geologic formation known as the Zion Beach Ridge Plain, um, again, in far Northeast Illinois on Lake Michigan. 
The initial acquisition by the state um, was in 1948, and it involved the southern portion of the park that you see in the graphic on the right. And in that graphic, north is up. Um, later additions um, occurred in the 70s and 80s, and um, they had previously been residential properties that succumbed to some erosional features, which is going to be um, a constant um, in how we talk about our project here. Um, as Joseph noted, this our shoreline is six and a half miles of natural shoreline. It is the largest remaining artifact of natural shoreline in the state of Illinois on Lake Michigan. We have about 2.8 million visitors annually, and they're able to use beaches, um, go into our two large nature preserves, which prefer, um, preserve this very unique um, ecosystem that's at this park. In that ecosystem, we have over 650 plant species located in um, four dunes, dune ridges, and swales that are, are in this very unique topography. Um, we also have, um, for other public recreational options, um, 230 Class A campsites located um, in a less disturbed area. We have a beach resort and conference center with 92 guest rooms and over five miles of multi-use trails. In the far north end of the park, there's also a marina. It's a full service marina with 1,500 boat slips. Next slide. And this is a sad news slide. Over a hundred acres of land has been lost to shoreline erosion. We are unfortunately located on the erosive side of the lake. We started doing sand nourishment to replenish our um, beaches along that six and a half mile stretch in 1983. And there's been a pattern of re-nourishing um, constantly as the lake levels have fluctuated and e the amount of erosion has fluctuated. Um, so a 30 year pattern of the public seeing their beaches um, show up and disappear and show up and disappear. The last sand nourishment was done in 2018. In total, we spent well over $10 million um, for sand nourishment projects along our shoreline. And you can see some of the items that have been affected. We have in the pictures below, the left picture, infrastructure, um, utility infrastructure, building infrastructure, the middle picture, roadway infrastructure. And the far right picture, you can't see it, but we've lost four dunes in the erosion. This was in the most highly eroded portion of the park. And there was a beautiful trail along the shore. Um, in this location. I'm going to hand off next to Martin so he can describe a little bit more from the coastal engin engineering point of view, the dynamic of what's happening here in the engineering solution um, proposed. Thank you, Laura. Yeah, next slide. Um, so as, as Laura indicated, uh, the, the park has seen a lot of erosion over um, the last years and the last decades. Um, this is a historic, historically erosive shoreline um, with approximate erosion rates around 10 feet per year. Uh, the image on the lower right uh, indicates some of the most recent shoreline recession in the northern portion of the park, uh, just south of the marina. Um, and one has to keep in mind that uh, it, the lake levels, uh, which are not sea levels, are, are variable and hard to predict. And there's periods of high uh, lake levels and lower lake levels. And with those fluctuations, um, there are uh, variations in shoreline erosion. Uh, but as you can see here, over just a 16-year um, period, there was almost 225 feet of shoreline uh, recession. Uh, next slide. And uh, this shoreline erosion varies along the park. Um, the lower left corner indicates um, the um, the areas where there's higher erosion or the shoreline has been uh, erosive um, in, for successive years, uh, while certain portions of the shoreline are more stable in yellow or uh, slightly depositional in green. Um, but the high erosive areas indicated here with, with area one, area two, and area three in the lower uh, left graphic uh, are the areas of concern. And many park assets, as Laura 
introduce them are at risk. Uh, not only the infrastructure and the amenities and facilities for the public, but also the uh, unique ecological features uh, and, and habitat. Um, and if we leave this erosion unmitigated, uh, many of these infrastructure um, and assets will be uh, severely damaged in the next five years. And the ecological uh, functions uh, will, will be further uh, endangered. Next slide, please. Um, so to that end, the IDNR set up a, a project uh, with, with two goals. The primary goal was obviously to stabilize uh, the shoreline and protect the shoreline uh, such that the, uh, the critical infrastructure uh, would be protected and the natural transitory littoral processes uh, would be slowed down and uh, erosion um, would be slowed, slowed down. Now, the secondary goal would be to have this project be fully integrated with the park and, and meet and match the, the characteristics of the park, both in its mission and its aesthetics, uh, and if possible, also enhance the user experience. And uh, to that end, uh, the, the term engineering with nature uh, you know, applies. Can we come up with a project design that takes protective elements and have a co-function to support uh, the ecology and basically create an, an uplift. So the IDNR um, uh, took uh, consultants on board to develop this project and study the issue. Um, uh, next slide. And uh, those consultants came up with the original uh, shoreline stabilization strat strategy, which would be a, a series of breakwaters uh, for the three areas that see the most shoreline erosion uh, combined with beach fill and beach nourishment uh, to create a wider beach and, and provide a buffer. Uh, that um, strategy would reduce the longshore transport and, and stabilize the shoreline and make it uh, more resilient to fluctuating lake levels. Um, there was many modeling and a physical modeling done as well to test the configuration and, and come up with this plan. Um, and ultimately the, um, the basic layout and this plan was uh, permitted in April of 2022. Uh, next slide. Um, uh, prior to that or, or during that process, the IDNR um, set out the design built um, contract mechanism uh, with the intent to have a design build team further uh, refine the project and get it to construction. Uh, also with a specific focus on developing the habitat and ecological function of the project, which was uh, up to that point, uh, not, not very well defined. Uh, so in the fall of 2021, uh, the design build team provided the proposal to IDNR and the Michaels team was selected in the spring of 2022. And since that time, we've been working to finalize the plans and specifications uh, for, the, for the project. Uh, we worked through additional permit modifications as well to uh, reflect some of the, uh, the small changes that had occurred to the project design. And uh, since March of last year, construction has been ongoing. Uh, and construction is ongoing today. Uh, and uh, Michael's expect to deliver the project later this summer. Next slide. So uh, as a quick overview, uh, what we have in these three project areas, uh, going from north to south, area one is a, um, a beach fill uh, and 10 nearshore breakwaters, of uh, which one is a uh, shore attached breakwater, breakwater 1-1, uh, as well as a small groin structure at the southern terminus of this area. Um, next slide, please. Area two um, is a, a series of seven breakwaters combined with beach fill. Uh, within area two on the northern end, we also have a, a separate groin structure uh, to the north of Kellogg Creek. Uh, that's included in this area. And uh, most importantly, in area two uh, is 
uh, where we have aggregated all the habitat elements and habitat enhancements enhancements of the uh, of the breakwater structures. And then uh, next slide, area three. Area three is the uh, recreational beach area. Uh, there, there's a total of five breakwater structures combined with beach fill uh, for this uh, for this project. Um, next slide, please. So as part of the uh, design build process, uh, Muff Nickel and, and the contractor Michaels worked together to uh, optimize the design, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, so we looked at standardization of the breakwater structures, um, standardization of gradations and, and geometries to uh, facilitate construction and um, basically get uh, ef efficiencies in, in placement of uh, the materials as well as in the construction schedule. Um, so many of these breakwaters uh, follow a similar approach of a, uh, a bedding platform shown at the at the bottom of these structures uh, consisting of bedding stone and then uh, uh, filter and, and toe stone um, uh, as, a, as a basis, uh, which supports the armor stone. Uh, this structure shows a, a crest elevation of 586 that's in the, uh, the Great Lakes datum. Um, so that is um, a sticking out of the water. Um, There's some other structures which are uh, lower in elevation and are uh, barely emergent. Um, next slide, please. And uh, yeah, that's the uh, the engineering uh, summary part of it. I'll I'll hand it off to uh, Heidi here to educate everyone on the uh, the habitat elements. Hello, everyone. I'm going to uh, narrow our conversation, as Martin just suggested, just to the habitat elements. But I, I first wanted to just reinforce one more time that the primary habitat project goal was focused mostly on the high quality terrestrial habitats in, in this setting. We wanted to make sure we weren't losing any more of this irreplaceable and, and precious uh, natural environment that was located behind the shoreline. So we wanted to construct offshore shoreline stabilization structures in three locations, as Martin identified, areas one, two, and three. And um, these would be used to mitigate that erosion and, and pressure on those special terrestrial spaces. But our secondary goal was to layer on more value, more habitat intention, pairing that really with the, the um, goal of this project to support and enhance the environment overall. And specifically, there were targets for avian and aquatic species. Next slide. In the avian realm, we were looking at three coastal bird species of special importance, the uh, piping plover, the common tern, and the Caspian tern. It so happens that the beach nourishment activities offer us a lot of benefits for piping plovers. We know from other adjacent uh, or nearby, I should say, natural beach areas along the western shore of Lake Michigan, that when we have shallow sandy slopes in adjacency to native vegetation, piping plovers have been returning and we're excited to see them come back to this project site. Additionally, the breakwater structures hold the right lake position for turn habitat when they're amended, amended with nest structures to meet certain other uh, habitat parameters. As we come out of the sky and into the water, the IDNR had requested a focus on mud puppies and yellow perch as our target species to try to support with our, our habitat amendment specifically. But as a design build team, we knew that we had the opportunity to trial a variety of aquatic habitat elements that should support a wide range of desirable aquatic species. Next slide. During our uh, proposal process, we were provided information about the habitat basis of design. This gave us insight as to what the IDNR was really hoping would be included as part of the delivered project. And if you look in the upper left, the amoeba shape is actually a, a breakwater structure that's been modified to be more organic, uh, more fuzzy. In most cases, we're looking to sort of deconstruct the engineering approach and make it more natural in form where possible and, and, and uh, appropriate. They're also looking to add uh, turn nesting pods on the top uh, of the breakwater structures, again, as high out of the harm's way of wave action as possible. And then on the lee side or the, the shoreline side, 
with the breakwaters quieting the waves, giving us some conditions where we can add smaller grade materials to the lake, uh, lake bed, a lot of different rock uh, of different size, some organic matter in the form of root wads or other driftwood. Um, and then modifications again on the breakwater structure as possible to in continue to uh, increase the range and type of quiet niches that we can uh, form in and around these breakwaters. On the right of the side, you'll see in section um, how the, the breakwater is really deployed. The vast majority, again, of the breakwater structure is below the water surface, which is shown here with a heavy line. You can see the turn nests uh, perched at the highest point on the top. And then in these near shore environments, adjusting the lake bed or the bathymetry to adapt to certain habitat uh, amendments. Next slide, please. So to recap, what we're planning on is elevated and isolated turn nests on the breakwaters, offshore breakwaters. We're looking at the beach fill providing um, incredible new habitat for the piping plover. What we started to call rock topper, which is this irregular stone placed on the lake bed around the breakwaters, uh, very targeted to help us benefit again, a whole handful of uh, living organisms within the water column. We're looking to trial a range of submerged vegetation solutions uh, in hopes of getting some of that element to take in these quieter settings. We're looking to utilize driftwood found throughout the project area to, to add that organic matter, that uh, amazing amount of additional surface area to the water column to allow aquatic creatures to come in and around and use those spaces. And then finally, on this side, we're looking to repurpose both concrete block that exist on the shoreline, as well as uh, customized concrete blocks to meet certain habitat criteria of our target species. Next slide. Here, uh, looking at some of these existing materials, uh, it, we really intentionally did a salvage material inventory. What could we uh, reclaim off of this shoreline for a number of different purposes? First of all, we can't leave uh, the, this type of accumulated material in the places where we were going to be um, amending and adding to that beach shore profile. This material needed to be removed, and it included large volumes of driftwood in various uh, stages of decay, very weathered all the way down to recent windfalls. In the lower left, we have a whole handful of shoreline stabilization measures that had been applied in this area over the years that are in various states of failure. The largest material that we're going to repurpose here is in the middle. It's these large uh, concrete blocks, four feet by three feet by three feet, uh, referred to as eco blocks. Uh, whether that's a trade name, we're not sure, but that's one item that we're heavily reusing. And then other random materials that you'll see in these other images, all of which uh, uh, could be inventoried and uh, repurposed. Next slide. That material reuse schedule was helpful in a, a handful of different ways. And you know, first of all, it's just simply reduction of construction impacts. If we can reutilize materials that exist on the site, we're saving in haul off, we're saving in landfill, we're saving in all sorts of um, uh, indirect consequences to the construction activities. But more importantly, we need these items. We, we wanted these items to help us create the habitat uh, detailing. And so it was a gift in many ways that we could capitalize and reuse a lot of this material to our benefit. Next slide. Just one example here of how we're pairing two of these elements together. We've got this eco block, uh, large concrete surface that we can uh, tie to driftwood in this case as an anchor and use it as a method to create these tangled piles of, of wood underwater. Again, one of our uh, more exciting bits of, of how to apply the driftwood to the site. Next slide. Back in cross section here, how we're looking to apply these different components is summarized on this slide. We have the high uh, wave energy from Lake Michigan coming at us from the left side of, of the image and it's broke uh, against the breakwaters and calmed such that on the lee side between the breakwater and the shoreline, uh, the reconstructed beach shoreline, we have an entirely new littoral habitat, uh, much quieter, something that can start to accrete and, and, and allow for things to assemble and be beneficial to aquatic life where it couldn't have otherwise without the breakwaters. Next slide. To start out with, we're going to start at the top of the breakwater and, and work our way down um, in, in providing more detail about each of these habitat elements. So 
The turns in particular uh, were this uh, special construction need. Their uh, nests needed to be uh, customized for the breakwater surface, but we wanted to have these man-made structures reflect as much of the natural habitat conditions that they would have been familiar with. Looking at these images, their ground nesting um, approach is uh, one of the reasons why they're so vulnerable. Um, tons of predation happen on these nests, and it's one of the reasons why a, a ha whole handful of protective measures need to be provided. They used to uh, protect each other with large colonies, and the numbers have declined to the point where that's not a viable situation, and, and the um, populations continue to decline. So this project really has the opportunity to increase those numbers. And in the upper left, we're looking to replicate this um, sand and, and small pebble uh, nesting material out on our man-made breakwaters and have the terns themselves bring some of this uh, dead organic matter from the preserve to help uh, line their nests. Next slide, please. Some early iterations of the, the thinking about the turn nests. We were uh, looking here at the upper left at, at one of the breakwaters in particular and exploring some of the range of, of sizes uh, for the nest or even forms for the nest. Ultimately, we concluded that a cylinder form was the most repeatable, most constructible, um, and most beneficial overall. And so we continued to evolve that idea um, and kn knew that we wanted to install it only in the areas where we wouldn't have uh, wave action flooding the nest. So we were really limited to just one breakwater in, in uh, our work area to get us to that elevation. And then we needed to detail the nest further to make sure that it still supported the fledglings um, as they were growing. So we considered things, like I said, uh, related to wave topping, but also predatory pressures. Um, owls, uh, great horned owls are one of the uh, uh, true predators on this uh, creature, the terns uh, themselves. And so ways to prevent those uh, predators from actually accessing the nest was another part of important part of the consideration and project. How do we integrate those into our design, uh, custom design nest features? Next slide. Going from those early sketches to our permit drawing, where we were looking in this particular point in time at making this uh, uh, nest out of precast concrete. And in the cross section, I can highlight a few design details that, that we were thinking carefully about. I didn't highlight on the prior slide, but one of the things we learned uh, in the construction process of the breakwaters is that something called range poles, essentially large I-beams are driven into the lake bed and used as part of that uh, breakwater construction. It dawned on us that we have a nice anchor here that we could use to be sure our nest was secured to the breakwater and wasn't likely to be pushed off with ice action over time. So we, we opened up this precast construction to have a, a donut hole in the middle, uh, sleeved that over the uh, H-beam, and then capped it with a bed screening material that nesting uh, products could be set on, and uh, as well as a shade structure for the fledglings that could also serve as a mount for our deterrence. So you can see this layered thought process of program tied back to detailing in, in the construction itself. In the lower right corner, you can see how we've deployed the uh, 10 turn nests. In this case, uh, they're in the salmon colored circles. So they're all ganged together at one end of this breakwater, hoping again to gain colonial benefits. The gray between them is uh, additional stone that will start to link these uh, turn nests together. Next slide. So I want to share some more evolution here as uh, the design build team is continuing to work towards final installation of these elements. Here we're at Michael's yard in Milwaukee and we're getting a review of their uh, mock-up of the turn nest. We've changed our material to weathered steel. This ended up being a much better uh, process for us from a scheduling standpoint, repeatability standpoint, a whole handful of things that caused us to pivot. And I, I just want to walk through what we're looking at here on the upper left image, the bottom of the image is essentially normal waterline. And so it's as if we're coming up on a boat next to the turn nest in this image. So it, the, the breakwater is proud of the normal waterline, the turn nest sits above this. And in this mock-up itself, what's not included is a stone that would be uh, placed in between the 10 turn nests to allow for that connectivity. The next image shows us actually underwater on the lake bottom, looking up at this breakwater. So again, the majority of the structure is underwater, providing that wave attenuation and, and shoreline protection in that way. 
As we climbed up the breakwater and started to look a little bit more closely, you can start to zoom in on some of those uh, aerial deterrent features. We have pointed uh, uh, tops so things can't perch and quick release of a series of deterrent cables that really prevent larger predators from getting into the nest itself. In that center lower image, we have an overhang overhanging shade structure that's integrated into the construction. And you can also see, um, this was an interesting evolution that uh, was worked out as the shop drawings were evolved with, um, we thought initially we would have the base uh, mesh be at two halves of a circle, but it ended up working out a lot better to divide that into four pie slices, both for ongoing maintenance, ease of access. So really trying also to think about how the ID and our staff was gonna use the turn nest long-term for their important monitoring work in support of uh, this, this species. Next slide. So coming out of the air and into the water, we're uh, again trying to deploy these features that we've talked about in the upper left, the, the tree structures, the branches, the roots, creating these tangled environments that are extremely attractive to aquatic life. In the lower left and lower right, these uh, rock surfaces added to the bathymetrics or lake bed surface to really add a wide variety of conditions for a whole handful of life forms to inhabit. And then this goal to get submerged vegetation established in some of the quieter places on the lee side of the breakwaters, uh, really uh, we're trying to challenge ourselves to achieve all of these different things in these environments. Next slide. In cross-section, looking at the rock topper specifically, uh, it's not a small amount of material we're looking to add in these concentrated zones, again, in these protected spaces immediately on the lee side of the breakwaters. We want to uh, pile the stone uh, ranging from several inches to several feet deep, creating a highly undulating surface across the zone that it's deployed, um, again, just maximizing the variability. On the right, you can see the um, back at the yard again, the materials are starting to accumulate. And um, this is one of the, the ranges of grades that we're looking to apply in this, in this space. At the bottom of that pile, I'd also like to point out another uh, way we're deploying the eco blocks. Here we've added some new pick hooks. And if you go to the next slide, We can show you our concept around creating these vegetated environments that we're going to set again on the lake bed in the quietest spots that we could find in the hopes that they serve as uh, essentially a, a nursery or, or origin point for the vegetation to expand out from. Um, Another metaphor to think about here is uh, this is to a certain degree almost a little green roof under the water. We're, we're not going to be planting into the lake bed itself. We're bringing down an environment that we can control and amend in the hopes that it'll start to influence the near environment and on its own actually perpetuate for a long period of time. Um, not only with the, the coir materials that we're wrapping these concrete blocks with, uh, but also with the biomass that the growing plants themselves start to con uh, contribute to the assembly over time. So we're, met, we're wrapping these concrete blocks with coir, we're embedding them with the submerged plant material parts, and then half of the blocks we're putting out in the water just as we're showing here on the right without any protection. The other half of the blocks, we're adding another element. Um, we're mostly trying to figure out if herbivory has a, a factor in establishing vegetation in this setting. And so we want to eliminate that portion of the prod or of the possible um, ways that it wouldn't be successful, but also gain another form of, of habitat itself. Uh, the screen has been designed to encase the vegetated block and keep out larger fish but the grid opening is three inch by three inch. So lots of small fry or small fish can come into these screens and again, be protected, find places of refuge. So trying to layer on the different benefits with the different uh, components of each prod of each element itself was also part of our thinking. Next slide. Back at Michael's yard, uh, looking again at more mock-up materials. Here we're switching to that vegetated screen. In the center uh, uh, image, we've got the single screen um, on the ground. We've got our block in the center. We're, we're figuring out some of the installation logistics here in this meeting. Lower left, you can start to see our coir materials gathering. We're gonna weave these together and drape them over the blocks before we plant them. Um, we're very excited about this fabrication process. Next slide. Switching to another habitat uh, type that we were very eager to uh, maximize in this setting, 
mostly because it wasn't offered by the uh, breakwater uh, construction itself. This is legend covey habitat. In, in freshwater systems, this type of habitat is really important for species that like to inhabit these areas, especially our target species, the mud puppy. Uh, these ledge uh, scenarios are really important for a series of their life cycle stages. Next uh, slide. So as I'd said, the, if the rock uh, structures of the breakwaters themselves weren't gonna help us, uh, can we use this idea of custom 3D printed concrete blocks that have been widely um, uh, deployed along the coasts for specifically tidal environments? Can we switch the design, modify these designs to favor more ledge environments? And so we did a whole handful of, of design explorations of how to uh, craft something like that. Next slide. And we started working with a uh, fabricator, Natrix. They're developing these uh, concrete blocks for us. And we started to iterate on the logistics of the design uh, fabrication process. Here, we started out trying to maximize ledge, but got very quickly uh, pushed back our, our thin, uh, way too thin on our uh, structures to survive long-term. Next slide. We got a lot chunkier in response to, to that approach. And here we're actually ending up with something uh, that had been coined uh, stacked fish sticks, maybe Lincoln logs, depending on your reference point. But we're getting, again, a lot of ledge condition developed here. Um, the modeling was uh, exciting to consider. But on the left, as test prints started to roll out, um, some issues with consistency and durability really caused uh, us to iterate one more time. Next slide. And you can go to the next slide. We're ending up with this form. So instead of having ledges coming off and cantilevering from a center post, we're really coming out to a four post, four corner post and a center post solution, offering us instead um, long ledge conditions of varying depths uh, across the entire block. So this is exciting uh, to trial. It's been fun working uh, with a fabricator who's willing to explore some new options and um, it'll be exciting to see what the outcomes of these are. Next slide. To change course a little bit, um, I've been explaining a lot of the details of some of the habitat elements, but we also gave a lot of thought to the layout, not just how the, the elements were um, detailed themselves, but how would they be placed on the lake bed, especially in and around the breakwaters. Uh, as had been originally mentioned, um, the design build, build team submitted a proposal for all the habitat to be spread out across all three areas. But as the team worked, it became really um, apparent many benefits were gained by bringing all the habitat together in area two. And so as that part of the design process unfolded, uh, we realized that we actually had two different situations here, a shallow reef environment, less than seven feet in water depth, and a deeper uh, a reef environment, more like 10 feet in water depth. And that if we were smart and approached how we did these layouts as consistently as possible, we could create um, perfect monitoring analysis and defensible outcome um, uh, from that monitoring based upon this repeated process of layout and um, uh, the analysis possible in that comparison, one breakwater to the other. So very excited about the ongoing monitoring to help us help inform us going forward which of these habitat elements have been the most successful, what would we change, et cetera. Uh, we did do as a design build team baseline monitoring in these areas to get our pre-construction conditions to reference going forward. So that's just another background part of this project and really did inform how we ultimately did do the layout. Next slide. Zooming into that layout and some of the specifics of it here in the shallow reef, again, three of these repeated very consistently in terms of form and, and content. Because of the shallow water depths, we're really only limited to these three habitat elements being able to be applied in this setting. In the gray, we have rock topper materials, and those are placed on either side of a stone spur, which is one of these extensions um, off of the, the breakwater, the main breakwater, that give us additional areas of, of quietude, additional niche space that we can tuck some of these other elements that we want more quiet conditions to benefit from. In this case, my limestone ledge material, which I'm hoping again to really support my mud puppies with, gets that premium uh, uh, quiet position tucked up into that corner. Next slide. As we would shift then to the deep reef elements, we apply all those same components, but now we get to add the rest of our toolkit. 
We've got our different types of uh, reclaimed and custom concrete blocks situated both on the rock topper, tucked in the niche around the rock topper. We can now place our vegetated blocks both in screen and out of screen. And we can add our, our driftwood anchored and piled to create uh, that tangled mass of organic matter. Next slide. Again, in cross section here, we'll zoom into the next side. Our vision uh, as all of this comes together and, and construction is finished is we've got fledging turns on our, our breakwaters and we've got a, a synergistic compilation of a kit of parts that together really create a rich uh, uh, aquatic environment for many different species to gather to the benefit of, uh, of both the, those creatures and uh, recreationists as well. And with that, I'll hand it off to Ben Kopsel. Thank you, Heidi. Thank you. I'm Ben Kepsel. I'm the project manager, construction project manager with Michaels Construction, and I'll discuss the, the build aspects of this design build project. Um, the, the screen right now shows area one, breakwaters, uh, the fortification uh, nearing completion. The barge plant is working on the south end of area one um, in, in this picture. Uh, next slide. So this project requires a lot of hard and durable rock, over 650 million pounds of rock, 325,000 tons. Uh, the closest hard rock quarries to the project are in Waterloo, Wisconsin, and Lannan, Wisconsin. The, this slide shows a picture of the Waterloo quartzite uh, quarry. Uh, from this quarry, the stone is trucked about 65 miles from the quarry to the dock. And then we used about 170,000 tons of material from this quarry, mainly for the armor stone layers. Next slide. This is a picture of the, an aerial picture of the second quarry in Lannan, Wisconsin. This is the Lannan quarry. And in the background of the picture, you can see Lake Michigan and Milwaukee because this quarry is a lot closer to the Milwaukee dock. We used about 155,000 tons of material from this quarry. Uh, mainly for the underlying layers of stone, the bedding stone and the filter layers. Even though this quarry is closer and trucking be less, this stone's not as durable as the quartzite and therefore we can't use it for the armor stone layer. So that's why we used it for the underlying layers of stone. Next slide. The rock is shipped from those quarries and placed on our dock in the, in the separate piles. Um, at any given time, we had 50 to 60,000 tons of material sitting on our docks. The, the stone is loaded onto barges at this dock. This is our dock in Milwaukee uh, on the Kinnikinnick River um, near the port of Milwaukee. Uh, the stone is loaded onto barges. Um, the barges hold about 2,000 tons of stone or about 100 truckloads of stone each. Next slide. After the stone is loaded onto the barges, uh, usually a pair of barges is towed to the job site with a tug. Um, and that, that trip's a 45 to 50 nautical mile trip that takes about seven hours to complete. Next slide. And this slide is a map that illustrates that whole delivery uh, logistics from the landing quarry and the Waterloo quarry um, to the Milwaukee dock, uh, the towing route down to the job site and to the Waukegan dock. Next slide. Then once the stone reaches the site, it's handed off to the marine plant, which places the stone. Uh, that marine plant uh, is a, has a four-man crew on it that works 24-7 and only heads back to the safe harbor uh, when there's bad weather. Uh, the crew operates the deck winches that lift the spuds that hold the barge in place. They operate the tugboat that moves the barge around. They operate the excavator that places the stone. And they operate and maintain the ancillary equipment on the barge uh, that allows them to work offshore for weeks at a time. Uh, the spud barge is huge. It's 54 feet wide, 180 feet long, and 12 feet tall. Um, and the excavator on there is also huge. It looks small on this huge barge, but it's a huge excavator, 150,000. Um, or a 150 ton excavator, 300,000 pounds, and can lift a 20 ton boulder. Next slide. The excavator that places the stone has a thumb on it that allows it to grab the stones and gently place the stones into the work. The excavators are all equipped with a GPS system that allows the operator to place the stone underwater. Next slide. After the breakwaters are complete, we start the sand nourishment. 
Uh, this is a picture of the area one sand nourishment starting back in, um, I think it was July of last year. Uh, the sand is mined from local pits in the area as opposed to being reclaimed from the lake. Unfortunately, the sand offshore of the project was just too fine. And frankly, there wasn't enough sand uh, in the system to fully nourish the project. Next slide. The sand is mined from the local pits in Illinois, immediately west of the job site. The sand's trucked uh, the 20 to 30 miles to the job site and placed in the beach in designated dumping areas. Next slide. The sand is then distributed throughout the beach in off-road trucks and pushed around with dozers. The, uh, the bulldozers have GPS, uh, which allows them to, to place it to its final grade within one inch of the tolerance. Um, regarding progress, we're just about done with the breakwaters uh, on, the, on the project. We have one breakwater left to go. Uh, we'll be done with that within the next month. And we're about two months away from completing the, the sand nourishment on, on the project. Then we'll finish up in early summer, probably May and June, with installing the habitat elements in area two. Next slide. So just a bunch of numbers to take home with you. This is a $69.5 million design build project. And that distribution uh, for work on the site is about 20% of that, 27% of that value goes to the sand and 66% of that value goes towards the, the offshore structures. Uh, the total contract time was just under two years, but the design and permitting portion of the project required nearly a year, leaving only about 12 months to complete this project that consisted of 325,000 tons of stone, 530,000 cubic yards of sand, and a multitude of habitat elements, including the, the turn nests, the 3D printed blocks, the vegetated concrete blocks, rock topper, rock spurs, rock ledges, and the reuse of the driftwood. Next slide. And the final slide. So this project can team project consists of uh, more than just the people that are on the phone today. Um, we would like to acknowledge Dale and Laura with the DNR, um, Mark Jones, uh, the project manager with the Capital Development Board, who's been great to work with, and also the Smith Group and Edgewater team um, that performed the, uh, the bridging documents with the Capital Development Board and made the transition of data between the bridging team and the design build team a really seamless effort. And then with that, we'd like to take some time to address questions uh, from the audience. We'll have Joseph moderate those questions, then he'll hand them off to the most qualified respondent. Go ahead, Joseph. Yeah, there, so we are, uh, we've got just one minute left. Um, for, so I'll ask one question. Um, how was the almost six feet of lake variation accounted for in habitat design? Um, and were differences in current forces associated with that considered? Uh, Heidi, do you want to? Yeah, <clears throat> certainly. So we, we were given parameters mostly about the extremes. Uh, so we wanted to make sure that from the habitat amendment point of view, things were not going to be visible above our um, recorded low water level. So that gave us an elevation of 576 to work with. We had to have enough water depth for everything to fit below that. Uh, and and still perform. So wherever we were in the lake, that, that was a pretty important factor. Relative to how they would change with the water levels um, uh, moderating, the beach edge is the one that's the most uh, susceptible to the lake level changes. So all of that enhancement and nourishment work was done very carefully, engineered very specifically. I'll hand it back to Martin to talk a little bit about closed cell, cell open cell planning related to the sand, but without a doubt, Lake level was a huge factor of how we considered both the placement, the design, the character, all the features of the, the habitat. Yeah, thank you. And I, I guess I can speak uh, briefly to uh, the exposure. Um, as we deal with la lower lake levels, water levels are lower and therefore wave energy, uh, wave heights are less and just wave action and, and wave energy is compared comparatively lower than when the lake levels are higher um where more wave energy can you know uh, reach around the breakwaters if you will um but in those cases of course the um 
habitat elements are further submerged and less subject to those higher energies. Um, so there, there's a, a, a positive trade-off there. All right, well, we are at time and I wanna let people move on with, with their day. Uh, thank you all so much for, for joining. Thank you to the, the panelists who shared this project. Congratulations to the panelists who shared this project on earning wedge verification. It's a, it's a really rigorous standard to, to meet. Um, and as you guys saw, they did incredible work. Um, so thank you all. The, this presentation will be posted, uh, or the, the video from this the recording, we posted it at Waterfront Alliance's YouTube. We also have on our Waterwire blog at waterfrontalliance.org. Um, next week, we'll be posting the, uh, uh, an insight article uh, on some of the habitat elements uh, written by the team. Thank you all.